Well, it's great to be with you again this morning. And uh, as we begin today, we're going to continue uh, our message in the book of Exodus. As I uh, remember just a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the people of God, the Israelites coming out of Egypt. We're going to continue, um, really kind of a continuation of the last message. Just as a a uh, quick reminder that last couple weeks ago, we talked about the people of Israel that have been enslaved in Egypt for over 400 years. And that God has sent Moses to Egypt to deliver his people, and God performed this mighty deliverance at the Red Sea. And, uh, and the crossing of the Red Sea marked uh, really as the beginning of the Israelites' journey through the wilderness. They first entered the wilderness in Mara, and then to Elam, and then they moved from Elam to Dafka and to Alush, and then eventually to where they are today, the story today, which is in Rafadim. And you can read these stages in really in Numbers chapter 33. So here is where we begin. We meet the Israelites in Rafadim in chapter 17 of Exodus 17. So. Exodus, the book of Exodus in 17. So according to the previous chapter in Exodus 16, the two million Israelites into this region, this is an important note to understand that they had entered into this region, or Rafadin, only six weeks after they crossed the Red Sea. Only six weeks after they crossed the Red Sea. Which means that every person here in chapter 17 had personally, had personally experienced the, great, the greatest miracle in the history of the world, right? This is really important to know. So it is within these contexts of the wilderness journey that we reach Exodus chapter 17. The Israelites, having experienced God's miraculous miraculous deliverance and ongoing guidance now faces another challenge in the wilderness leading to the event that we will read in Exodus chapter 17 verses 1 through 7. So if you have your Bible turn to Exodus chapter 17 verses 1 through 7. It says the whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin. Desert of sin is a location, not sin as we think of. It's a location. All right? Traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. Do we have that passage on the on here? No? Okay. They camped at Rafadin and there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why are you quarreling? Why are you arguing with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. And they said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock Die here in a thirst. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, says, What am I going to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. Right? So the people were so angry, they're ready to stone Moses. And the Lord answered Moses, says, Go out in front of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock of Horeb, strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel and he called the place Masa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us? Or not. Let us pray. 
Father, bless the reading of your word. Speak to us this morning, Lord. Open our hearts to receive your words. Help us understand this important event that happened in history that continued to happen in the lives of each and every one of us, Lord. Father, we just pray for revelation and pray for uh, you to speak to us, each and every one of us, in a very personal way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We got any big coffee drinkers here? Okay. We are, in our family, I know Joy and I are a big coffee drinker. Mom is a big coffee drinker, but she's cutting back, which is good, right? And uh, just really enjoy a cup of coffee in the morning. Imagine getting up in the morning, and uh, if you are the serious kind, that uh, you ground some fresh beans, and, uh, and you go to the faucet, and you turn on the water to get some water and realize there's no water. No water's coming out. You turn on the news and you see that there is a water shortage. Not only for today, but there's a water shortage for the next week. That there will be no water available in the LA and Orange County area. Can you imagine that? Chaos will absolutely break out, right? Can you imagine at Costco or at one of the grocery stores, people will be fighting for bottled water, right? Crazy. But that is what we're seeing here in this passage in Exodus chapter 17. Moses and the people of Israel are in the wilderness. And they are confronted with this new problem of no water. It is not the first problem they had to deal with during the past six weeks. But it will not be the last as well. But our focus here is how they responded facing with this new trial. In verse 2, we see the people began to argue with Moses, right? Arguing, complaining to Moses, give us water to drink. They were demanding Moses, give us water to drink. However, we must understand here that they are not just complaining to Moses. They are, in essence, complaining and challenging God, right? As we will see in the scriptures, their attitude towards Moses here and with God was progressively getting worse as time went on. The question we must ask here, we must stop and ask, is do the Israelites have a reason to complain? Do they have a reason to complain? From the scriptures that we see that God has been leading them through the desert. They have been experiencing one difficulty after another in a series of many difficult challenges. But the pattern is that God was faithful every single time to meet their needs. Did God ever fail to meet their needs? If you ever look at Exodus 16 and 17 during that six weeks period, no. He came through every single time. Even when the children of Israel did not deserve it. So I think from the Israelites, from their perspective, they are making their complaint against Moses and they were having an attitude like, really? What? Why are we enduring this again? Why are we having to deal with another unnecessary adversity? That's kind of their mindset, right? What, where, what, why is this happening to us? That sound familiar? We all do this, right? Once in a while, right? What, why is this happening? Why is this happening again? Right? This was their mindset. But what they don't realize is that God had intended this series of, diff series of difficulties for the nation of Israel. There was something that God was doing. Some commentators, the Bible commentators, called this period of time for the people of Israel a spiritual boot camp. They call it a spiritual boot camp because that is really what God is doing. God was teaching these people to trust him. You see, for God, it was not just about the journey. It's not just about getting to the promised land. For God, it was not just about arriving at a destination. For God, the journey was just as important as getting to the destination. 
I want to remind us this today because it is true for all of us as well. It is not just about us getting to where we want to go, but it is about this journey of getting there. When we go on vacation as a family, I have this really bad habit of not liking to stop, right? When I set my mind on, on getting somewhere, it's really about how fast I can get there, right? Not the journey, it's about how fast I can get to the destination. We could be on vacation to Hawaii or just on a road trip, and I, the, my family knows I will only stop for gas, restroom, and food. Right? Oftentimes, Joanna will say, hey, stop here. Look, at wow, it's beautiful. Let, let's stop and take a picture. Nope. We can't stop here. We got to get there. Right? That's usually my attitude. When I was writing, when I was writing this, this, this sermon, when I got to this point, I asked myself, why am I in a hurry? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea why I'm in a hurry. I just want to get where I want to go as fast as I can. For the most part, I'm not even interested in a journey. I just want to get there, right? So in a spiritual sense, our destination is heaven, right? That ultimately is where our journey ends. But there is a purpose in this process that God has us in. The journey that God has set before us, God has a reason for the adversities and difficulties that comes our way. But the children of Israel did not understand this. They were not interested in getting this because their hearts somewhat were still in Egypt. They forgot when they faced difficulties, when they encountered difficulties and challenges, they forgot what it was like of being a slave. All they could remember is we had food to eat, we had water to drink, we had a shelter. Instead, we're here in the wilderness, in the heat. We have no water, right? The children of Israel have not yet really learned to surrender and submit to God's leading. It's important to note that it is only six weeks since they came out of Egypt. Every trial they experienced brought out the worst in them. Every trial they experienced produced in them this increasingly negative response because their heart was still in the past. They couldn't fully understand what God was doing in their lives. Brothers and sisters, as we start this new year, as I believe there's no accident that God has put us in these verses in Exodus. Today, I want to give you a strong exhortation. Clearly, it's for me first, but I want to exhort you with this, that God allowed the testing of our faith to teach us to trust him and to depend on the Holy Spirit. God allows the testing of our faith. God allows adversities. God allows pushback. God allows problems. God allows tribulations in our lives. There is a purpose. We're on a journey. These things that happen to us oftentimes are divinely intended by God to teach us to trust him and to depend on him. We all experience trials in our lives, and God calls us to take the narrow path. You've all heard this, right? The narrow path is all, there is the wide path, right? The freeway, and then there's the narrow path. God calls us to take that narrow path. That narrow path is often filled with potholes and bumps and curves and unknowing obstacles. Sometimes for us, we roll into church. It's like we're the only one going through these problems. God, why am I the only one having these issues? Why is everybody else life perfect? Why is, why is my life so miserable? Why is my life so hard? Right? Or we might say, God, why is this church not full? Why do people leave? Why can't we be like the church down the street? I long for the days of the past. 
Why is going to church so hard these days? Why, why, why? In James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, it says, do we have that? Do we have, do we, do we have James chapter 1, verse 2 and 4? No? No, okay. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Let me say that again. So that you may be mature and complete and lacking in nothing. The key word here is in verse 3. He says, because you no, because you know. Instead of asking why, James is saying, you already know this. You know this already. Why are you complaining? Why are you asking why? You already know this. Think back on the goodness of God. Think back on the faithfulness of God. Think back on the deliverance of God. Whatever difficulty you are in, you're going to be fine. In your difficulty, God is teaching you that in your various trials, whatever that might be, money, relationships, health, career, whatever it is that you're wanting God to do in your life, God is teaching you patience, teaching you to wait on him. God is teaching you to trust him. The patience have his perfect work so that you may also be perfect and becoming spiritually mature and completely lacking in nothing. If you're taking notes this morning, there are just two things that I want to emphasize in our passage in Exodus this morning. The first point is we need to choose to trust God and not test God. Let me say that again. We need to choose to trust God and not test God. We need to choose God and not trust God even just in the last couple of messages that we have studied in Exodus. We have already seen over and over again the same thing. There's a problem. The Israelites complain and God comes through. There's another problem. The Israelites complain and God comes through. That, unfortunately, is the story of the early Israelites. Here in Exodus 17, we see that they are again facing another situation, this water situation. And they have made the decision again not to remember how God has come through before. What they should do is instead of complaining and arguing with Moses, they should say, hey, 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 listen, everybody, just calm down, just relax. We have been here before. And God has been good. God has been faithful to us. We need to just relax and look back and remember God's faithfulness and provision of our needs. However, they intentionally chose not to remember that in their most difficult times, God gave them a deliverer in Moses. They choose intentionally not to remember that God provided a pillar of cloud that guided them at night, right? And a pillar of fire at night, uh, in the day, cloud in the day, and fire by night to guide so they can't get lost. And they choose not to remember that there was the parting of the Red Seas that gave them safe passage. And God destroyed their enemies. In Exodus 15, God turned bitter water sweet so they can drink. In Exodus 16, God provided manna, bread from heaven, when they were hungry. If you look through the book of Exodus from chapter 7 to chapter 17, God performed over 30 
five miracles for the people of Israel. All of this in six weeks. And you would think by now that they would have learned to trust God, but they did not trust him. Even though God has shown himself faithful over and over and over again. Not only did they not trust him, their response to this adversity was also getting progressively worse. The Bible says here that they are arguing, quarreling with Moses. The word quarrel means to fight and to test. While they were taking their aggression, anger out on Moses, but what they were really doing is they're taking their anger and complaining and arguing to God. Not only did they argue with Moses, but they were testing the Lord. Here in verse 4, it says, Why did you bring me out of Egypt to make us die of thirst? Why did you bring us out of Egypt and make us die of thirst? Their unbelief has become a cancer that has metastasized and has grown to the place of rebellion. They were quarreling with Moses to a point that Moses was literally crying out to Lord, to God. He says, Lord, what am I going to do with these people? These are awful people. They're ungrateful, dysfunctional, angry, and out of control. They are literally want to kill me. By focusing on their current circumstances, it caused them to question the faithfulness of God. Because God has come through over and over again. Now the, the Jewish people, the Israelites, were conditioned. All right, I want to make sure that we really understand this. Because of God's faithfulness that he has come through for us over and over and over again, they are now conditioned to base their faith in God performing another miracle. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right? Because of what God has done, now they have based their faith on God performing another miracle. This is how hardened their heart were. They were testing God, saying that we won't believe you until you come through with another miracle. No, God, we don't count the past. We are not acknowledging that there are trails of faithfulness. We are not acknowledging that there is a foundation of love for us. We are not acknowledging that you have been faithful over and over again. We will not trust you until you perform another miracle. Does that sound familiar? Brothers and sisters, there's been moments in our lives, or has there been moments in your life where you have forgotten the faithfulness and the goodness of God because of the difficult circumstances that you are in? As a church, have we forgotten the faithfulness and the goodness of God and the blessings that he has poured upon this church through the years? I want to encourage all of us to not treat God like this in our lives. When we go through adversity, when we go through struggles, there's always a temptation to wonder and to question God if he has come through before. When in fact, God has been nothing but faithful to us and he has been consistent in his steadfast love for us. God meets us every morning with new mercy opportunity to start fresh every morning. Let's go back to the passage today in Exodus 17. It is important to note something. To note that this event that happened in Raphadim, this event with water and complaining, this event that happened in the wilderness was so significant in the history 
people that in verse 7, Moses renamed Raphadim, Masa, and Meribah. It was so significant, he renamed the land Masa and Meribah, which means a place of testing and complaining. A place of testing and complaining. He renamed it just like putting a stamp on something so people in the future will always remember to never act like these people. To never test God and to never forget the faithfulness of God. Just how important was this event in the history of the Jewish people? There are over 20 times in the Old Testament and the New Testament that this event in Masa and Meribah was mentioned. This idea, this failure of the Jewish people, right? Of people not trusting God. It is a lesson that is etched throughout the Bible and is a lesson that we continue to learn for all of us today. Let's take a look at a couple of them. In Hebrews, in the New Testament, chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, God here is addressing a group of people that had drifted in their relationship with God. So they were turning away from faith and from Christ, and God reminds them, So, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as you did in the rebellion. That's what God called this event in Masa Meribah. God calls it a rebellion. Right? Do not harden your heart as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness. Where your ancestor tested and tried me Though for 40 years, they, 40 years they saw what I did, that is why I was angry with that generation. I said their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways, so I declare on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And in Hebrews 3, 15 and 16, it says, Today you will hear his voice. Do not harden your heart as you did in the rebellion. Who were they that rebelled? They were those who Moses led out of Egypt. In the book of Deuteronomy, it records one of Moses' last sermon to the people before he died. Of all the things, you think of all the things that Moses has did and all that he has accomplished for God, his last words were a reminder of what happened here in Masa and Meribah. He said in Deuteronomy 6, 16, Do you remember that time? Do you remember what you did in your relationship with God? Moses said, Do not put your God to the test as you did in Masa. Do not Put your God to the test as you did in Masa. When you treat him as he has never come through for you before, where you condition your faith based on performing another demanded miracle. In the New Testament, when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, you remember the story that it was early in Jesus' ministry that for 40 days, 40 nights, that he was in the wilderness, fasting, praying. And it was at that time the devil came and tempted Jesus three times. In the second temptation, the devil took Jesus to the top of the temple. And he said to Jesus, if you're really the son of God, cast yourself down. Because doesn't the word say that he will give you angels? To charge over you, to save you? In other words, he is saying to, to Jesus that God promised to protect you. So if you are really the Son of God, throw yourself off the temple and demand that God perform a miracle. 
And it was right there that Jesus quoted this verse in Deuteronomy 6.16 and repeated to the devil, which pointed straight back to this story, which Jesus said to the devil, you shall not put your God, Lord God, to the test. God took the children of Israel to the wilderness to build their faith, not to destroy them. Let me say that again. God took the children of Israel to the wilderness to build their faith, not to destroy them. And God take us through difficulties in our lives to build our faith, faith and not to destroy us. What's really sad is that their unbelief blinded them to this amazing thing that God was doing in their lives. And their unbelief, their bad attitude, their ungratefulness blinded them. They just couldn't see it. I'm saying this to us today because when we complain and we grumble, when our circumstances is difficult, our attitude is bad, we will miss, we will not be able to see, we will blind ourselves to the great things that God is doing in our lives. You know, as a family in 2008, we made the very difficult decision to move to the Bay Area because of work. Our kids were very young at the time. I think Ethan was in second grade at the time. It was a very difficult decision. I have been in the education industry at that time about 15 years. And I've experienced nothing but success for 15 years. Everything I touched turned into gold. Everything was successful, right? So we went up there, we felt God has called us there. And, and um, this is a story that I don't think I've often told is that for a long time, many, many years, it was probably one of the most difficult periods it was incredibly difficult. So difficult, it causes me to question God often. God, why did you take me here? Why is this so hard? Right? Why or, or I've experienced successes, nothing but success, and all of a sudden failure after failure after failure, and try to rebuild something. It was so hard and so difficult professionally. It caused me to really question God over and over and over again. It caused me to really not trust why he brought us there in the first place. It wasn't until many years later when I began to look back in our lives. In the day of it, I began to realize, boy, how blind I was. Because I was focusing so much on my own misery on the challenges that I was facing personally, I didn't see the journey, I didn't see what God was doing in our family, in our lives. God was so good, even in those times in the desert where I felt so alone. God blessed Joanna with an incredible opportunity an incredible opportunity to minister to minister to the students and to the women and the various women and friends that she has met. My kids had an unbelievable education. The friends that they have made, the opportunity that provided themselves, provided for them. There was so much goodness that came out of it, but for so long I did not recognize it because focus on my own circumstances. Yet God was so faithful along the way, every step of the way, providing for our family and our children. And I believe a big part of what shapes our family and our children's lives today is it because the experience that they've had during those 14 years up in the Bay Area. Some of us has walked through the process of the Spirit of God correcting us in our unbelief. Having our blindness taken away 
And then in that moment, really see the goodness of God in all that he was doing. All of those things that are seen and unseen in our lives, which cast away any doubt, any attitude of unbelief. Those are experiences in my own life that I have experienced. That God has opened my eyes to see the things that he was doing in my family, in our lives. I'm glad Ethan's here today. Right, the last five months in Taiwan has not been easy for him. Right, it's been, it was lonely. It's like being in the desert sometimes. Right, but through that experience, I'm sure there were times that he wondered and complained and asked, God, why am I here? Why did you bring me here? Why does this keep happening to me? Why is this not happening? I have a plan. I know what I want, but it's not happening, right? But the reality is, through that experience, he began to experience the faithfulness of God, right? I'm sure there were times in his life in the last five months, he was thinking about, gosh, it would be so much easier if I was a... Kind of like the, kind of like the Israelites thinking about Egypt. But through that difficult circumstances I'm sure God is speaking to him is working in his life what that ultimate journey is going to be we have no idea but I know God is working in his life that in the last five months he has learned a lot about him and his faith and his walk with Jesus praise God so this leads to our second point which is Jesus is the rock Jesus is is our rock. Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, speaking to the Corinthian church, the church of Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, he says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. Paul here is speaking specifically to this generation of the Israelites under Moses, this specific group of people. He says, they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. And for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Why was God not pleased with them? Because in their unbelief, they blinded themselves to the beauty of what God was doing in their lives. What was God doing? What was God really doing? God was manifesting Christ in the presence of his people. In verse 5, Moses, you see, is called by God to take the elders to this rock, right? This rock of Horeb. God says to strike the rock. So he strikes the rock, and the rock splitting was, was the rock splitted, and the water gushed forward from the rock. In the desert, a big rock, he hits it, it splits in half, and water pours out. Enough water to quench the thirst of two million people and livestock. This is what Apostle Paul is saying. That the rock that was split in half was symbolic of the presence of Christ among the people. The rock was Christ himself. This is such a powerful picture. I want you to see it because the Old Testament and the New Testament are so tied together. Moses is called by God in the midst of a very rebellious people, right? They have tested God and they have provoked God and they demand God to do a miracle. 
What they really deserve is God's wrath and justice, but instead, God uses opportunity again to reveal to them a picture of the coming Christ. In John chapter 7, verses 37, Jesus says, He alone is the living water. Where he is referencing, Jesus in John 7 is referencing Exodus chapter 17. Right? Where he says that all who drink from the spring of living water will never thirst again. That is what Paul is saying here, that Jesus alone is the rock. Regardless of your complaint, regardless of your unfaithfulness, you're complaining. I am faithful. God says, I will provide you with a savior who is the rock, who will be stricken and split and afflicted and wounded for your transgressions. He will be bruised for your iniquities, but out of this rock will flow out the river of living water that anyone that drinks it will never thirst again. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as we close today, I want to end with this thought. As we look through the Bible, why do so many miracles and stories begin in the wilderness, such as the story that we study today? Why? It is because the wilderness was always the meeting place of God and his people. Where does God meet Moses? In the wilderness, in the desert, in the land of Midian, in the midst of a burning bush. Where does God provide for the Jewish people? Is it in the land of Canaan, the land of milk and honey? No. As we see today, God provides for them in the desert, in the wilderness, over, over, and over again. It is always the desert. The the word wilderness in Hebrew literally means desert. Why does God meet us in the desert? Why does God meet us in the desert? God meets us in the desert because there is no water. God meets us in the desert because there is no food. God meets us in the desert because that's where the suffering is the greatest. God meets us in the desert because in the desert every well runs dry. And it's only then It's only then that you finally realize there is only one well that does not run dry, the living water, the spring from the rock of ages, from Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we often meet God in places of suffering. As someone once said that we might experience God in the mountaintop, but it is only in the wilderness, in the desert, when we get to know God and truly experience the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, no matter where you lead us, from the mountains, the deserts, to the wilderness, we pray that as your people, that we will not lose heart, that no matter how difficult the circumstances that life presents, that we will remind, be reminded of your faithfulness and goodness in our lives, how you have provided for us over and over and over again. Help us be a people, a grateful people, a people with thankful heart, a people that remembers your goodness in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.